there. My name is Heather Lee Cameron. I'm 27. I live in Raymond, Alberta, Canada, and recently I got wind of an event that was going on in Salt Lake about what Mormon women want, and of course that intrigued me because I'm a Mormon woman. However, when I looked at the page, it basically talked about how women want the priesthood and equal responsibilities to the men, and that's not what all women want. Not all Mormon women want to have the priesthood. They are happy being married to a priesthood holder because all worthy Mormon men can have the priesthood, and that's fine. I mean, it doesn't make us any less or more important because we have different roles. And I wrote a note a while back, it's called Don't Ordain Women, that I'm going to read, and I'm also going to read some things from a notebook that I keep notes in about different things, and the, about the atonement, and it's going to be a good thing to listen to, so please do. With all the craziness surrounding the Ordained Women organization, recently and even today, I will confess that I'm growing very tired of reading about them and they're trembling to the consequences that they were clearly warned about several times. I mean, really, for those who read the scriptures, really, people are warned of consequences if they have inappropriate behavior and they go ahead and do it anyway and then they're scared and shocked when the consequences come to pass. Even though they were warned. For those who haven't read about it, the founder of Ordained Women, Kate Kelly, was excommunicated for her continued persistence that women be given the priesthood even after being told to stop, both by God and the prophets he has called. And the Ordained Women group actually held a vigil for her on the day that this excommunication happened, and the disciplinary hearing and all this other stuff. You see, when people have a disciplinary hearing, there's a hearing, and people are given the opportunity to come and perhaps defend themselves, and she didn't even do that. So what did she think was going to happen? If you don't want mercy, how can it be extended to you? Anyway, this is a prime example of how little choices like not liking something can ultimately lead to grave consequences, hence which is why we must use our right and responsibility to choose very carefully, point in case, or case in point. Satan was once Lucifer, an angel in heaven, and simply because he didn't like the way that Heavenly Father and Christ were doing things, he tried to rebel as did a third group of the hosts of heaven, and he was ultimately dismissed. And they will forever remain as spirits. They don't get to have mortality, and that's an example of how a little choice can lead to grave consequences, because it, jealousy and anger is a little choice. And if left to fester, it can turn into a massive cancer. Anyway, why are they continuing to do what they are doing knowing what they stand to lose because they didn't listen when the Lord said no? I'm sure all of us have had experiences like that. Do they not understand the divine value that women have to God and to that which they are needed to do within his divine church? Yes, we are all human first in the important and the imperfections of mortality shall often get in the way of who we should be to ourselves, to other people, and to God. I mean, we're children of God come to earth and are taking on this challenge called mortality. And we should be proud to do it. It's not easy, but it's very much worth the experience. And honestly, sometimes I pity Satan for his stupidity and not wanting to take that chance. Hence, why the atonement exists. To provide divine help and healing if we want help. It's about what we want. The Lord's not going to give us what we don't want, so we need to want it in order for help to come to us. I don't normally rant like this, 
but we all need to see our divine value and role in God's amazing, incredible kingdom and understand that just because everyone has a different role in God's kingdom, it doesn't make anyone more or less important than anyone else in his eyes. You see, God loves us all equally. He does not play favorites. I don't desire to express hate towards ordained women, but I sadly do not think that ordained women and all of its supporters and offshoot groups truly understand the value we have to God and to the roles we are needed to take care of in order to help the Lord bring his work forward. Everyone's got their part to play. And if you don't understand that, try and understand it instead of just attacking it. If they do understand their divine roles and are, and are trying to question God's love and trust in what he has given them, that is incredibly sad and I can't help but be sad for those who don't cherish what God gives them. I mean, seriously. Why can't you cherish what God gives you and trying to, instead of just trying to seek for what you can't have. Seriously, grow up. God cares about every single one of his children and blesses us all with gifts and abilities that we may help one another and then gives us opportunity to do so through various works we do all over the world. I admit saying grow up was a little harsh, but that's what we're all doing. We're growing up to become better both temporally and spiritually. And if we waste our time engaging in things that we know are not possible instead of focusing on what is possible, well, that is truly a waste of our time. Additionally, God does not stop people from using their agency the way they want to, but he does not stop consequences from coming forth either. Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31, which is in the New Testament section of the Bible, for all you Bible readers out there, states, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And second is like, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. The first one is very obvious in that we should love and trust God and the second verse states that as children of God, we need to recognize the value in ourselves in what the Lord asks us in, in, and in what the Lord asks us to do. We all have importance to God and different responsibilities, but we are all equal in his loving eyes. Men and women simply have different responsibilities. Men and women are seen as equals and helpmates to each other. Ordain women and other nasty anti-groups put a nasty spin on it to make it seem like things are unequal. But women and men simply have different responsibilities and that's all it boils down to, folks. Nobody is inferior or superior in God's eyes. For example, men cannot give birth and women can, but women don't have to give birth to be considered mothers, nor do men have to have a child to be considered a father. There is more to serving as a mother or father than bearing kids. It's about the willingness to nurture and provide compassion where and when it is needed. For some it's natural and, and for some it comes with time and a lot of effort in developing it. The priesthood is about uniting families eternally. It is the power and authority to act in God's name in order to do that. The highest order and blessings of the priesthood can't even be held by a man unless he becomes married for eternity in one of God's temple in front of one of God's temples first. Because it's a blessing of unity for the family unit. I mean, you can get the Aaronic priesthood and you can have the Melchizedek priesthood, but the highest priesthood comes when you're joined together in unity under God. Sealed for time and eternity in his holy temple. 
And that way your family will continue even after death. And that's possible if we just believe and take the time to make the effort to strive for that. Not all Mormon women want the priesthood, and I'm not comfortable with all of the ordained women indoctrination and the, the fact that the event pretty much was a plug for them to try and share their flawed principles in a way that was disguised as, oh, we're going to do a huge description of what everyone wants. We're going to look at all sides, and from what I've seen so far, they didn't. If you truly want a discussion about what Mormon women want, have an equal panel with people from both sides of things, and have a true discussion, not just a one-sided discussion, because that serves no purpose, except to create a lot of hard feelings. Trying to lower God to any inappropriate behavior and trying to use the excuse that every Mormon woman wants priesthood to hide any guilt and falsely justify these inappropriate actions is apostasy. And apostasy is basically trying to say that you're better than God and nobody's better than God. We can all try to become like God, but nobody's better than God. And it's only because of Jesus Christ that we can become like God someday. I believe that those involved have intelligence, and it is good that they are sharing it. But intelligence must be used intelligently and with an awareness of both choice and consequence. All right. So now I'm going to read from this cool little book of little observations based on Scripture. You know, as time goes on, things happen, and we are sent, and according to Esther chapter 4, verse 14, we are sent to specific points and places because we are meant to endure things at specific times. But we can endure them well if we choose, and case in point, we are here now because there is even more of a need for defense for God and Jesus Christ because even now people are trying to tear them down and destroy what God stands for and what he asks us to stand for. But you know what? We can't understand we can't do anything about the evils unless we understand them not to the point where we become, where we become immersed in it to the but to the point where we know the tactics and to the point where we can maintain a healthy spirit. We are not able to defeat the evil until we know who the enemy is, and the enemy is Satan, and he has influenced many for bad, and it's up to us, guided by the Spirit of God, to influence many for good, and learn how to defeat them. I mean, we can't defeat each other, that doesn't serve a purpose, but we can defeat Satan, and through the Spirit of God we can help others become free of Satan's hellish influence. We all have our predestined part to play, but we must choose, choose to engage in behavior that will make us worthy and able to follow that path. I mean, we have our agency. We can choose not to follow that path and miss out on a bunch of great blessings that we can't even comprehend. Lest we lose the opportunity through poor use of agency. Basically, if you make bad choices, you might lose some blessings, and that's a terrible thing, but it happens. It's happened all throughout history, throughout scriptural history, and it will continue to happen. People will make choices, and then they'll lose blessings because of their bad choices. Anyway, you know what? And it's a sad thing, because people's bad choices like being involved in anti-groups and ordained women and all that, it can become a habit and a lifestyle. You see, choices are choices until a choice becomes a habit in which you can't live without doing something concerning that habit. And one becomes so dependent on the habit that it takes the choice away. 
until the chooser is so burdened by the dependency that they can't see beyond it. If you're so bent on trying to destroy God and Christ and forgetting your divine I identity, someday you're not going to be able to see your, div your divine identity. You're going to just forget it, and you're going to lose many blessings in the process, and it's going to be very sad. The atonement, fortunately, is infinite and eternal, and it provides the opportunity for the rose-colored glasses of habits and dependency to be lifted even after mortality ends. So guess what? We may have problems in this life, but guess what? There is a place called Spirit Prison for those who had problems in this life that they might be able to go and be relieved of those problems through the atonement and work their way with the help of the living who serve as proxies in the temples of God that they may be able to work their way out of that fallen state and into a happier state as if they had always sought after those blessings. And you know what? We are a prized possession of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. You see, when the atonement happened, we became a prized possession of Christ because he bought our eternal freedom that we may do what we will with it. As it really talks about in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20, A price was Christ's blood, and it bought our souls from the darkness caused by the fall. And with the freedom that comes, comes the opportunity to choose our eternal destiny. It's in our hands what we do. <clears throat> if we choose to seek Christ's help to do our best and do great, we can. If we have faith in God, Christ, and all things good enough to do good, if we have that faith enough to act in faith, our blood warms, our heart expands, and we are opening to learning and doing even better. We all have the potential, and we all have the opportunity to gain the abilities to become great and wonderful if we so choose to pursue that lifestyle. There is more to life than what we see with our naked eyes. If we work to have the right spirit and we are always preparing, we will be able to see the hand of the Lord and what he has to give and teach us. When each season of life comes, you know that each, you know that each portion of our lives has a season, right? And... Every season is different and everyone experiences milestones of life at different points in their lives from everybody else. Nobody's seasons are the same because people have their agency or people take longer to be happy and knowing about things. People take longer to adjust, but the Lord is very patient. As long as we are trying to live well, the Lord will be pleased with our efforts. But you know what? There are some that just get frustrated and give up and decide to rebel just because they don't feel they're doing good enough. And so the Lord scatters the rebellious either, spirit, either physically or spiritually. And physical scattering might mean separating people from their loved ones or their comfort zones. And the spiritual scattering is mostly done by us because we use our agency poorly. And we find ourselves cut off from the spirit. And we sometimes even physically scatter ourselves because when we do something that requires the intervention of law and order, we sometimes find ourselves needing to endure the consequences of what we have done. But fortunately along with justice comes mer mercy and mercy is extended if we want it but justice cannot be robbed so it really depends on what you want how will you take what the two-edged sword 
gives you. There is mercy, but you've got to learn something in order to gain mercy. If you learn nothing, then how can mercy be applicable to you? The atonement. Notice how I keep coming back to that. It enables people to come to the knowledge of their divine lineage and that they might offer themselves to Christ for redemption. You know, we can offer ourselves. We can choose to come unto Christ. We're not forced. We're not dragged kicking and screaming. We can choose it. We can choose to come unto Christ for redemption, refinement, and renewal because we are so much better than we see ourselves. We, as children of God, are destined to do great things within our time span of mortality and to receive great blessings. But if we misuse our agency, we may alter our divine destiny. And you know, I mentioned that those who die will get another chance. And it talks about in Doctrine and Covenants, section 128, verse 24 about that a bit and throughout the scriptures there's mention of work being done for the dead and how we the living can make ourselves worthy to go to the temples of God and serve as proxies with the people's name on a card who have died and we just do the ordinance work for them sacred ordinance work very sacred too sacred for discussion here but if you want information I will point you in the right direction for that. Every opportunity we are given to do work to help people on either side of the veil, we need to take and exercise our best effort in carrying the work out. Again, people have their agency. But you know what? That doesn't mean we don't have to give our best. Because we are an instrument in the Lord's hands when we want to be. And if we fail, if we choose not to, then we may have deprived somebody else of the opportunity, but the Lord will not forget them just because we might. Some really don't have the opportunity to know and understand that they are God's elect in mortality because the burden of mortality is so great. My father was an alcoholic before he died and now that he's not I'm so glad that he's going to be able to learn and grow and as a great child of God that I know he is and we all have that opportunity but it's better to take it in mortality if we can <clears throat> we can do great things there is, a, as it says in Doctrine and Covenants, section 107, verses 18 and 20, there is a divine purpose to everything and everyone. And without preparation to understand that divine purpose, how can we understand it? Without understanding it, we'll have no clue as to the responsibilities or expectations that are involved in the stewardships or the responsibilities we are given from God. <clears throat> Preparation helps, us, helps there to be understanding and eventual acceptance of the sacred nature of the duties and responsibilities and anything that God gives us to do. <clears throat> In other words, we need to magnify what we are given to do, even if it's just a small little bit at a time. And as it says in Doctrine and Covenants 84, section 84, verse 33, to magnify something is to see it as important. It is to examine the responsibility and what is involved and to examine oneself and see what either needs to be improved upon or remo removed in order to be better able to have the Spirit of God with you that you may carry out the responsibility. When one has a better handle on the Spirit by which the responsibility was given, one can have a better handle on carrying out the responsibility if we so choose to take it seriously. 
through the atonement we can come to learn and appreciate our value to the point where we allow ourselves to be cleansed by Christ's healing acts of virtue and renewed to a place where we can recognize and love ourselves again when we may have lost that ability to love ourselves. <clears throat> you see, we can be administered to and minister to others. <clears throat> Administering is giving to others on behalf of God as He has given to us and through His power and authority. And we are administered to by God, Christ, and His chosen people. And we can be a minister unto others. We can minister. We can give nurturing unto others. And that's giving to others on behalf of a heartfelt desire to give our best to help and uplift others as Christ did for us. So that we could be in a position to help others if we so chose. All right. As it says in Doctrine and Covenants, section 121, verse 40, Many are called, but few are chosen, because some do not choose to take what they are given seriously, and aspire for that which may puff them up, but not uplift them to the point where they are constantly guided by the Spirit. As those who want to and actively commit apostasy, they want to puff themselves up, but they don't take what God has to give them seriously. And as it says in Doctrine and Covenants section 121 verse 39, people are given authority by God to act according to the responsibility that we are given by Him. And with any power comes responsibility. And when people think that the power comes from their own efforts, when people think that success comes from their own efforts and that they don't need God and that God is only standing in their way, the Lord will find a way to humble them. We don't know when, we don't know how, but He will. So be aware of that. And don't think that you are all powerful on your own. We may be reproved with a sharpness, and that's not anger. That's getting to the heart of the matter, as I am doing with you today. And it is doing so with courage and exercising compassion, as I am doing, so that you all know that you're loved and cherished by God, even though you may not know all that you need to know and be doing all that you need to do. When we truly know and understand who we are and who we can become, we can wax strong in confidence. Because the atonement will not only help us to know who we are and who we can become, but help us to become who we are meant to become. And <clears throat> as it talks about in Isaiah 58.13 in reference to people wanting that which is considered apostasy, we should find pleasure in choosing that which would please the Lord and that which would invite the Lord's Spirit to be with us no matter our circumstance. So what if we live in the most despairing circumstances we can? We can still have a positive attitude and the Lord's Spirit can be with us and we shall be protected. If we strive to have the Spirit always, opportunity to receive the rest as in blessings, happiness, and joy... And peace will come to us as we strive to seek it. And it's very important that we not waste a moment. As it says in Alma, chapter 34, verses 32 to 34, which is found in the Book of Mormon. Don't waste this life living only in the moment because you have to think of tomorrow. I mean, moments are good. Moments are fine. You can cherish each moment. You can find great joy in each moment, but you shouldn't obsess over each moment so much that you forget about tomorrow and the next day and the next day that you miss 
other milestones because you're so focused on just keeping one moment alive. There are many moments that we can keep alive. We can really find peace and joy. And it's okay that we're imperfect. As it says in Luke chapter 2 verse 52, we are made up of many things and we choose what to focus on and we create a path by our choices. And when we change the direction of our agency, our focus automatically changes. We can choose to grow or stagnate, but we cannot choose the consequences of what we choose to do. We have intelligence and we can use it, but we cannot choose the consequences of our choices, so we need to about that. The camera just decided it wanted to do its own thing. Anyway, where was I? Ah, oh, yes. We can choose to grow or stagnate all we want. But we cannot choose <coughs> the consequences of what we choose to do. Remember that. Admitting imperfections and weaknesses is not the same as changing them. We can admit that we have them and say it over and over, but unless we're actually willing to do something about them, what good does it do us to say that we have them? One is making our problems a reality, as in confessing our imperfections. And changing our imperfections is being able to let it go and move on without looking back and turning into a pillar of salt. And you know, everybody's got their hills to climb, their mountains they aspire to climb. And we can find joy in every mountain we have to climb. And you know, my comments coming back to apostasy. As I've said, it's lowering or trying to bring God down to the point where he will permit our inappropriate be behavior. He's not going to permit our inappropriate behavior. We have our agency. He's not going to stop us from behaving inappropriately, but there will be consequences. Accepting the atonement is willingly elevating ourselves to the Lord's standard of behavior and discarding what is problematic because let's face it, nobody's perfect. There's bits of problematic behavior in all of us, bits of things we want to discard, but we don't know how to do it. There's how to do it, except the atonement of Jesus Christ. Come unto him as you are and become better than we could ever imagine. And you know what? Very importantly, God would not be God if he doesn't give everyone that has been mortal, an opportunity to take care of what they need to take care of. I mean, he really wouldn't. It's just inevitable. He loves all of us who made it to earth. Even if just for a little bit. He loves all of us. And everyone will have that opportunity to make things right with themselves and with God. So don't even think about saying that God doesn't care about you because he does. Anyway, everyone will be resurrected eventually, different times, different blessings will come, and all joy will come to all according to what they want. Growth happens even after death. And we need to take care of ourselves, both physically and spiritually, so that we can grow to our best potential. We can learn all we want, but you know what? If, we're har if our heart is not in it, what are we really going to learn? As it says in Moroni, chapter 7, verse 13 through 15, and again, it's in the Book of Mormon. Do and choose to do that which inspires you to help others. Inspire them and give glory to God because it will help us have the Spirit and keep us so long as we do not condemn others. And you know what? In terms of agency, God's love is so great 
that he would rather see us comfortable and happy than have all of his children come back to him because he's very aware that not all of us will because some people will use their agency as such that they won't be able to simply not because that God won't let them simply because they won't be comfortable and they don't want to be in the presence of God and that's that's as bad as telling your parents you don't want to be with them even though they've loved you and nurtured you your whole life but it happens and it's very sad Christ looks on the heart not the face because appearances can be deceiving but the heart reveals truth our hearts tell the Lord who we really are even if we physically act a different way and he will help us if we seek his help to be able to find that true self the atonement takes the pain of sins away and lifts the sorrow if repentance has been done but the memory remains within us as a reminder that we have changed and that we can use our memories to help others change it is an opportunity to help others when we sin we shouldn't strive to sin merely so we can help others that's ridiculous but when we do sin we can use it as a learning experience that we may help others to learn and grow as well we have the opportunity to gain knowledge that helps us to make choices and we gain value ex valuable very valuable experiences through both choices and their consequences and it is through what we gain and come to appreciation of our experiences that helps us to become wise we become wise because of life life makes us wise for better or for worse and you know what it's wonderful despite people apostatizing guess what we have this wonderful person called Jesus Christ who advocates for the sinner's rescue and we're all sinners so he's advocating for everyone and he did that with his atonement and he continues to do that he also advocates the safety of the atonement to they who need it but may not know of it or may not want it but he will not force anything upon people that will make them uncomfortable if we don't want Christ's love he's not going to force it upon us he's really not because even though we may do bad things we're not bad people we're not going to be treated as bad people we're going to be sorrowed for we're going to be grieved for whenever we fall off that great path and you know God does grieve for his children like a parent for any child who has fallen away or done something terrible he grieves at some point I'm sure he even grieved for Satan and that lost third group but you know what he doesn't grieve to the point of obsession sadness because we have made our choice on our own and he has to respect that and he will be waiting with his arms open when we finally come to our senses I'm sure and when people are lost in apostasy or in bad choices we can't hate them we need to love them because the people that are behaving badly aren't really free now are they They're trapped in their choices they're, it's become a habit a dependency so they're not really free as much as they think they are so all we can do for the lost and struggling is love them and pray for them and hope for them and leave them to God while we build on and enjoy what is working for us and try to include them where we can and perhaps be an example and help others come out of the hole that living in sin is and you know what apostasy is mocking sacred things that the Lord has deemed sacred and desecrating them with our words and our actions and only humility and repentance can help those who apostatize they can repent they still have their agency even though they have made such a terrible decision and the Lord will be there to help them but it will be a difficult road back and it takes a lot of outward and inner strength but the outward strength cannot make up for a lack of inner fortitude and preparation no matter how strong
you think you are on the outside. And it takes a long time. When our faith is great and active, God can work mighty miracles and the Spirit can help us become valuable instruments in the hands of the Lord that can help us progress and help us to give others a future of hope. And you know, apostasy and sin may be a comfort zone for others. And even though they may not be necessarily happy, they're comfortable because it's something they understand. And they may hate God, Christ, and all things good merely because they don't understand who they truly are and what they can truly become and how God and Christ can help them. Or they do understand that and they just don't want to hear it. And again, we can't hate people for this. All we can do is defend our position because their choices will destroy themselves. We don't need to do anything. They, through their poor choices, will dig their own hole and only they can seek the help to get out of it. We can't force anything upon them. By the fruits that come forth from experiences of the past, we will come to see and understand what to pursue in the days to come. We make the choice on our own to invite or repel the evil by what we do, where we go, and how we carry ourselves. As we reach out for evil, it will grab us hard. You see, by people's fruits and their actions, you shall come to do what you know is right because you will see what somebody truly is when you understand better who they truly stand for. And you can avoid that which will be destructive if you're aware of not only your own strength and weaknesses but theirs as well. Everyone is given knowledge and with what they know they pursue opportunities and experiences and through those it is learned as to what is worth pursuing and what is better off left alone. So, I go back to my first point about intelligence. Everyone is given intelligence and the opportunity to increase in intelligence. But... Not everyone uses it wisely. And you know what? We can't be forced to use it wisely, now can we? But know this. There are consequences to every choice we make. And we must live with the consequences of the choice we make. And it's really just stunning how people sometimes choose poorly just so they can hide from who they truly are and who they can truly become merely because they're not comfortable. They don't understand it or they don't want to because it would mean a great deal of sacrifice and work. And It's very, very sad that with all the unconditional love and compassion out there that God and Jesus Christ have for us, and all the opportunities we can have, people run like the wind. Or they try to fight God thinking that they know better. And it's very truly sad. It's a saddening thing. But sadly, that is reality. And all we can do is stand for what we know and through our good example, try and help others to see what we know and help them to understand. Compassion and love is the way to do it. We need to love God with all our strength and get our strength from Him. Or whatever higher power we, we draw to, because not everybody believes in God. And we need to love each other. We need to have compassion and love just because people engage in bad behavior does not make them bad people and all we can do is love and have compassion on, on them without condoning their behavior because that's what the Lord would do just because somebody behaves badly doesn't mean they're unlovable no 
Christ died so that we could all realize that we're lovable, even if our behavior is less than exemplary, even if we are acting in a way that is very inappropriate. We are lovable, unconditionally lovable by God and Jesus Christ. And we need to show that love unto others. Even on, we need to show compassion and mercy unto those who try and dispute God and rebel against Him because even if they know what they're doing, they will have their own consequences. And we just need to pray that they'll be able to come out of their ignorance and their hate and realize who they truly are and who they truly can become. We have our freedom to choose. But there are consequences to everything that we choose. And really, we need to be aware of that in order for us to be able to make an intelligent choice each and every day of our lives, each and every moment is precious. Let's not waste one moment of the time we have. Let's make the most of this life so that we can enjoy the best of the next. And with that said, I love you all so very much. And I close in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I hope that people take some things from this and use it to make their lives better. Because there is more to life than what we see with our naked eyes, and we are more valuable than we can even comprehend. See you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.